Today, I will show how to restore this very cracked dashboard from a 1980s Toyota pickup truck using these products. This came out of a mud truck that somebody did not care about at all. You can see they actually, I think, got mad and punched it. It's about the size of a fist and uh, may have stabbed it as well because there's these holes that went through the metal. So this is probably the worst one I have and I'm gonna be repairing all this. Now this isn't my first rodeo. Over here is my first attempt and it didn't look this bad at first, but it turns out that this was too thick. This is marine vinyl and it just had a hard time adhering to the contour of the dash. Not to mention, I didn't use the best glue. Then came my second attempt. I used four-way stretch vinyl and contact cement and the results came out a lot better. However, it did still start to bubble up and have trouble adhering to the inside of the recessed area. And then I put both of these two dashboards through an extreme torture test of freezing temperatures and hot summer heat. And you can see one did not hold up well at all. This one held up great. But there were some great comments from you, the viewers, when I was restoring this dash of why do I bother with trying to get the vinyl to adhere to this difficult shape when I could just spray it with some sort of texture and skip the vinyl altogether. So that's what we're doing today. Once again, I'll be starting with the Dremel, just like I did on these two dashes. And that's gonna to be to cut these grooves deeper and wider, and then I'll be able to fill them with spray foam. However, last time I just used the normal great stuff and once again, you, the viewers, let me know that there's a better option out there. So I went for the window and door, which is a high density. It's more expensive, but you all said it's going to work best. So we're going to try that. And then once I spray the foam and cut it down to shape, I may or may not still need to use some body filler to get it perfectly smooth. We'll see if it's still necessary with the high density foam, but just in case I have that. And then I have a variety of different textured paints here. I'll be testing each one of these to find out which one has the best texture. And then last, I'll be doing some different tests with paint to see how I'm able to change the color of these textured paints and undercoats to match the color of the dash. Let's see here. Here we go. This uh, mushroom shaped guy is my tool of choice for enlarging these cracks. My goal here is to make a nice, wide, U-shaped groove. Years of heat and sun actually causes these cracks to crown or raise up higher at the center of the crack. So actually cutting the groove wider than the crack ensures that the final surface will be level after I refill it with the new spray foam and add a skim coat of body filler. I'm also making sure to remove plenty of the foam underneath the vinyl because once the vinyl cracks, the foam under it starts to degrade from the sun and loses a lot of its strength. I've had cracked dashes with exposed foam that just disintegrates when I touch it with my finger. I'm applying new foam to fill the cracks, but it's important that the new foam has good original foam around it to bond to. Even these really tiny cracks need to be ground down to create a U-shaped channel. They may be tiny cracks now, but the last thing I want is to have them continue to expand and crown after I put all this work into restoring the dash. So now is the time to grind every crack, no matter how small. One can of spray foam is more than enough to restore all of the cracks in this dash. So here's how it's looking so far. Yeah, it gets worse before it gets better. You just gotta trust the process. Notice I went down all the way to the metal uh, base and that's fine because that's what the OEM foam was applied directly to. And there you can see those. I've got to guess they're stab marks from a knife. This dash has lived a rough life. Now it's time to play with some foam. This stuff is for windows and doors, which is the high density stuff. It actually expands less than the uh, regular great stuff. Thanks for your suggestion on this. I'll put a link for this in the description in case you're looking to pick some up for your dash. Clippy clip this guy on here. Pop this guy out of here. And 
we're ready to spray. First, let's get an idea of how this is gonna spray out of here. All right, good, but not too fast. All right, pretty fast when you're working in a tight area. Get a little more up here. I do want to make sure that the straw is touching the base when I'm spraying. I want the foam to be pressed against the very bottom of the groove. That way it will adhere better to the dash and there won't be any air pockets. I have a spreader here and I'm actually going to press the foam down into the groove. Again, just to make sure there are uh, no air pockets and make sure that the foam is covering from edge to edge of the groove. Look at how sticky this stuff is. It bonds well to just about anything. Also, as I'm pressing this down, I'm removing a lot of the tiny air bubbles from inside of the foam itself. And by smushing out that air, it's actually making the foam more dense. It's hard to be exactly precise with that straw. I mean, it's made for filling gaps around windows and doors, so it's fine for that. But for precision work like this, I really prefer to get in there with a spreader. Then add some more foam where needed. See, once I press it down and a lot of that air escapes, the foam is a lot smaller. And I'm not saying this is the best way to do it because you can see it's pretty messy, but this is the way I did it on my second dash restoration. And that one has held up great through heat and cold. So it works. It's pretty tough to form and shape around edges like this. My rule of thumb is I'd rather apply too much than not enough. I can always come back and remove any excess with the blade or the Dremel. Do keep in mind, uh, this stuff does expand, although supposedly not as much as the regular great stuff. First time user here, so uh, I can't say for sure how much. It actually looks like it's already started to expand right here. I can tell it has uh, self-leveled a little bit. All right, I'm calling it. Here's how it looks. We'll check back in a little bit. Well, it's been almost an hour and this thing has really started to expand. The surface is dry but it's still mushy underneath. What I'm gonna do is get a spreader and press it down. I can kind of form it into place a little bit now. And it's not sticking to the spreader like it was earlier. I can actually just use my hand. This is gonna save me a lot of cutting later. Also, I can tell as I'm pressing this down that I'm forcing some of the air out to escape which means that the foam is going to be uh, more dense when it dries. And I've got a lot right here. It's like a big foam bubble. The foam is really more contoured to the dash now. That will definitely save me some trimming. I'll give this uh, a couple days to cure. Hey, I let this set over the weekend and the foam is good and hard now. That's what she said. I can still press in a little if I really try, but uh, it is fully cured. So now I can start trimming off some of the fat. Let's see how this works. Oh wow. Not well. That's really dense foam. I think a coping saw should do. Here's a close look at this blade. Oh yeah, this works great. 
If you've ever used a coping saw before, they're meant for cutting wood trim and baseboards. And you can kind of control or steer the direction of the blade depending on the angle of the saw. It's kind of hard to explain, but it's pretty intuitive. It works great for this. I'll put a link for a coping saw in the description. A hacksaw blade might work as well, but uh, the teeth are really fine, so it might cut a lot slower. I think I messed up. Yeah, I cut too deep there. I have a body filler file here. And this is like a cheese grater. And it's perfectly flat. So that's gonna help get the foam filed down to be flat with the surface of the dash. Makes quite the mess, but it works well. I'll link one of these in the description too. I can't get down in this corner with the file, so I'm carving this section out with a razor blade. And it's sort of working. Getting there. Now I'm able to shape this corner better. This is feeling pretty good so far. If I had a good way to hold this dashboard, it would be a lot easier. Here's my razor blade. I'm removing all the uh, excess foam around the vent opening. I can see that I have a low spot right in here. I'll have to build this spot back up with the body filler. Otherwise, I'm happy with how this is going. And I definitely like how dense this foam is. Thanks, guys. Now, I couldn't get in the very corner here with the razor blade or this one. So, I'll use the Dremel. The Dremel shaved down the foam with ease. So, I went ahead and trimmed the foam on all of the edges of the vent openings. I still have a little more foam to remove before I add the body filler. Shaving down the foam is a subtractive process, so it's actually better to go down a little farther than needed before adding the filler, rather than applying the filler and then realizing that the surface is too high and having to remove the filler and the foam and then go back and reapply the filler. This is getting a little messy. Here's a close-up look of how close I carved the foam to the original surface shape of the dash. I have some sandpaper here, 80 grit, and I'm going to scuff up the entire dash because this is a smooth sealed surface and Bondo or paint won't stick well to it. The vinyl surface that Toyota used is actually pretty resilient to scratching. So 80 grit paper works great to scuff up the surface. I'm not worried about uh, sanding through or anything. I'm only sanding until I'm uh, about through the factory final texture. And that's plenty scuffed to give the filler something to bite to, as well as the paint later on.
Changing up the direction is a good idea. Get a lot of scratches in different directions. And I'm just looking to evenly sand down the entire surface with this 80 grit. Here's a closer look at what I'm doing. This is a good scuffed surface for the filler and paint to bite to. I keep going back and forth, calling it Bondo and filler. That's like saying uh, Xerox machine and copy machine. Same thing, but Bondo is just a common name brand. I can feel very slight low spots where there's foam. And that's perfect because I'll have a skim coat of filler on top. Look at this right here. This is a low spot that didn't get scuffed. Yeah, I can feel it. So I'll get in there with uh, just my fingertip. And fill that with some Bondo as well. Can't forget about the bottom edge. And the inside edges of these vent openings. Now the entire dashboard is fully scuffed with the Gaty Grit and it is very dusty. I need to remove all dust, oils, contaminants uh, before I can apply the filler. And to do that, I'm going to use some wax and grease remover. I've got a rag here and dump some of this on there and just wipe down the dash. You've seen me use Dupacolor's wax and grease remover in a lot of my videos, but that was the aerosol can version, which is actually quite toxic. I mean, it works great, but definitely use it in a well ventilated area. And I don't recommend getting it on your skin. This kind is the uh, friendly to humans and to earth version. It's soy based, so I can smell it all day. Dump it on my skin, chug it. No, don't drink it, dumb joke. I'm not trying to get sued. So it's perfect to use in my basement workshop. I'll put a link for this healthy version in the description. That's good. Now, just give it a few minutes to dry. Bondo, cardboard, scooper, spreaders, hardener. I'm using some USC Chromate Light, and I'm just using cardboard instead of an actual mixing board. I know a mixing board is better, but I'm not doing body work on a show car. I say cardboard is good enough for this old dashboard. Go ahead and make fun of me in the comments for trying to save a couple bucks. Here's some other filler I had. It's kind of hard and feels beady inside. Yeah, that's expired. I need to be able to squish it and knead it like this to mix it up. By the way, that other gallon can of uh, blue filler that I had at the start of the video, that was expired too. So I grabbed this from the garage and it's definitely gonna need some stirring. This is still usable. It just sorta separates over time from sitting. Kinda like peanut butter. This is looking good now. Get a little more on here. And add a little ribbon of hardener, a little more. That's good. And just keep mixing until the blue is all blended in. Let's start on the foam here where I need it the most. In the big low spot where I cut too deep. And slowly swipe it on there. Crap. I was probably out of frame there, wasn't I? It's a one-man show here at the 6th Gear Garage. And the cameraman really sucks sometimes. If you've ever iced a cake, you can do this. I made a cake once. 
And I think this is actually easier. It was a complicated cake though. For Wayne's birthday. Shaped like a butt. With a Hershey kiss for the butthole. So when he ate it, he would have to eat ass. Alright. I need to focus. And uh, keep this PG. It's actually the exact same concept as bodywork. If you've ever used filler and bodywork on a car, then you can do this. Pretty soon this is going to start to thicken up as it starts to cure, and then it's not going to spread well. Instead of icing, it's going to start to spread more like uh, Play-Doh. So here's a close-up after round one of body filler. I'll let this cure, and uh, we'll check back in the morning. All right, it's time to knock down all these high points. Normally I'd use two hands for this. That would probably be a lot easier, but it's getting the job done. I like to start with the file instead of sandpaper because this makes a lot less mess. It makes crumbs instead of dust that floats in the air and lands on everything. Ah, crap. That's a huge gouge. I must have caught the edge of the file on there. All right, I've got all of the high points knocked down. Here's a close up of how it's looking. My hand's not getting caught on any more high points. Now it's time for block sanding. It's important to use a block here instead of just my hand or fingers because I'm trying to make this surface smooth to match the contour of the dash. And this 1980s Toyota dash is boxy with mostly flat faces and edges. If this was a rounded 90s dash, I'd probably use like a flexible sponge, which is not flat. So I could shape it to match the curve of a newer dash. But the block will help make sure that everything is flat and smooth. Notice I'm sanding in a crosshatch pattern. It helps things move a little faster and uh, helps me sand all the contours. This front does have a slight vertical curve to it. And that's good for round one. Pull this 80 grit off the block here for these hard to reach areas. I will have to use my finger. It's kind of tedious. But the 80 grit paper does sand down the filler pretty fast. This is actually foam on here. Let's cut that off. Now I like to scratch up these areas, these uh, low spots. I'll be applying more filler here and a rough surface will give it something to bite to. I'm not sure if this is absolutely necessary, but it's something that I always do. It's not weird if it works, right? After vacuuming, I gave it another wipe down with the wax and grease remover to make sure there was no dust on the surface. Round two, really focusing on building up this low spot.
just going across real lightly. Now I'm really pressing down here to uh, press the filler into the recessed area. Since this area is pretty good, it doesn't need built up. Curved corners can be a little tricky. I'm happy with that. I'm by no means a professional. If you're an actual professional body worker, uh, let me know if I'm making you cringe. I cut a big spreader in half to make this little spreader. Perfect for these tight areas. Oh, there we go. That should make the professionals cringe. A little bit too much there. If I'm going to have too much, though, I'd rather have it on the top surface than on this inner edge. Because I can easily sand down the top edge with a block or a file. This inner edge where the vent sits is only going to be sandable with a tiny piece of 80 grit in my finger. So this is round two, and I hope that I'll be able to have this dash formed and uh, ready to primer after three or four rounds of Bondo. I remember the very first dash I did took forever because of all the times I had to apply the Bondo. So here's a close-up look at the end of round two. Far from smooth, but general to specific is the way I work. And that low spot is looking a lot better. I see a small dip right here. I'll be sure to get that in round three. The filler is cured. Time to knock it down with the file and sand it smooth. You can see I still have a lot of low areas to fill. That's what all of these darker green areas are. The top looks good, nice and straight. The front too, but that's just with my eye. The sure way to tell is to use a straight edge. We're good back here. I can see a little bit of gap right here. I need to build this up a little. And right here still needs to be built up some more. And the bottom edge is looking good. Time to prepare for round three. I thought this would be the final round of Bondo, but as we'll see, I was wrong. Up here, I'm just laying down a very light skim coat using the small spreader. Just filling in any minor imperfections at this point. And I'm going heavy here in the center where that big low spot was and the idea is to feather it out and make it thinner near the edges get these spots up here back to the small spreader to build up that low spot here in the middle and I'm just doing a skim coat over these smaller repair areas. There's a small nick right here. I have some really shallow areas on the bottom. Really more just from where the Bondo didn't get spread smooth enough last time. I always get to the bottom edge last, so the bondo is starting to cure a little bit, transforming from icing to Play-Doh thickness. Right here, I need a little bit. Get a 
skim coat on this. Clean this uh, inside edge up a little so I can avoid all the finger sanding. Like this, sticking up doesn't bother me. I'll knock it down in five seconds with the file. I have a little gouge or something right here. Just put a little more on that. Oh no, I'm about out of time with this batch. You can see how chunky and rough it's laying down. Well, here's how it looks after round three, potentially the final round. While that cured, I headed to the garage to test out the different textured paints. All right, the Bondo has cured and it's time to make a mess. Once again, I started off with the Bondo file, then switched to a smaller file for the details. Then finally to the sanding block with the 80 grit. So that wasn't quite enough Bondo. I'm still low right here. A little low down in here. Some smaller areas to fill as well, but this is getting there. However, I forgot to test fit the vents. I wanna make sure these edges don't interfere. This one should be fine, but it's these two I'm concerned about. Goes in this way. Oh, sh That's not even close. This one's a little better, but still, no bueno. Even the corners that I didn't have to repair barely fit. They are the OEM vents, by the way. I should have checked this before I got this close to the end and uh, just slipped my mind. So I'm gonna have to take a good chunk out of this corner. Something about like this. All that's gonna have to go. And over here, this one's not as bad, but uh, but I still need to fix this corner, this top corner, and up here too. At least it's just the corner and uh, the side is able to stay. I went back with the Dremel and enlarged the vent openings as needed, and it actually turned out better than I expected. All right, I'm good there. This one's still a little tight. I hate forcing these little plastic vents because they do get fragile with age. I need to take a little more off here. I think we're there. Still tight on the right edge. I didn't realize how much I had built up that edge. Still a little tight. Fourth time's a charm. There we go. That's what I want. Next, I did a little sanding with my finger to smooth and round out some of the edges I created with the Dremel. And went back over with the block and took a careful look to find all of my low points that needed to be filled. I took a minute to mark them all so I wouldn't miss any when working quickly with the Bondo. Then cleaned up all the areas I was about to work on. And it was time for round four, what I thought would be the final round of body filler. Just like last time, I'm doing a skim coat to fill in any of the low areas or scratches at this point and fine tuning some of the edges. All right, here's a close look at round four. This should be it. Once the filler cured, I knocked it down with the file and then the sanding block, and then got into the details with my finger. All right, this is looking smooth, except I did screw up and put a deep gouge into it. The very corner of the file got caught in the surface. I must have not held it perfectly flat. So I need to fill this now. So one more round of Bondo it is. 
And that's not the worst thing in the world because there were a couple other spots that I could have finished better. Like this right here. I'm not at all OCD until it comes to this stuff. I need this to be extra smooth because I'm not wrapping it in vinyl. I'll be spraying it with one of these paints. So I don't have the thickness of glue plus vinyl to hide imperfections this time. Spoiler alert, this fifth round of body filler is actually going to be the last one. Filling these cracks sounds easy on paper, but it actually takes a lot of attempts to get a perfectly smooth surface, especially if your dash is in really poor condition like mine was. I mixed a smaller batch this time since I was dealing with minor imperfections at this point. All right, the filler is all cured. I'm gonna skip the file this time and go straight for the sanding block. So now I'm at the point where I can paint this dash with some primer and get a consistent sealed surface. And then I'm gonna be able to paint on my texture. Now I did some tests over here and you can see each one was a little bit different. Uh, the truck bed coating wasn't quite as textured as I had hoped. <laughs> the bed armor didn't exactly spray out too well. It might've been frozen at some point, but it was about the same texture as this. The rubberized undercoating was a little bit more smooth and also it smelled exactly like road tar. You can see it kind of dried this weird brown color. So I'm not sure I want to use that on this anyways because there might be a lot of chemicals in there that could also disrupt the primer or the paint that I'm going to put on top. Texture metallic, pretty cool, but really not too textured. And here's the winner, splatter paint. This is designed for the inside of trunks. It's hard to see the actual texture because of the uh, white specks in it, but it does have a nice texture to it, probably the most similar to the texture on the dash. So I did a little bit of research on this. This is a water-based formula, and they don't actually make this anymore. They make it now, it's just called trunk paint, and I don't know if it's the exact same, but on the back, it does say use only on trunk interiors. So I don't know if that means it's gonna be okay uh, in sunlight on a hot dashboard on a sunny day, but we'll find out when I do the torture test on this dash once it's all complete. But for now, the next step is getting some coats of primer on this dashboard, so let's get started on that. And you can tell just by the way this is drying that there are certain areas, such as where all the filler was, that are very highly absorbent that sucked up all that primer. Whereas on the vital surface of the dash, it's gonna take a lot more time to dry. So the primer has had time to dry. You can see it's still pretty splashy, a lot of unevenness. So I'm gonna do one more coat. Now after a couple coats of primer, all the flaws and uneven areas really start to show. However, all these minor imperfections are so small, that they should be covered up by the textured paint. So a couple things I learned when I sprayed the test sample here is that going heavy is not good. Light coats are what you want. If you go heavy, it actually just kind of pushes it out of the way and makes low spots. Also, there's no ball in this can. I shook it for a good five minutes the first time and realized that. Light coats. First coat is dry. Here's a close up of how it's looking after two coats. I'm gonna let this dry overnight and see how it looks in the morning. So I'm still seeing a lot of the red primer through this. So I guess I'll just keep on applying more coats. All right, I waited a couple days just to be sure. And now this paint has fully cured. You can see it's quite rough though. So this looks 
Honestly, pretty cool in my opinion, but I'm going for an OEM look, so all these white specs are really throwing that off. Now, if you remember, when I originally recovered this dash, this four-way stretch vinyl was black, and I painted it with this charcoal gray vinyl and fabric paint. And you can see this charcoal gray is a pretty close match to the OEM gray, but what I don't like is that this dash is a flat gray. These interior parts all have sort of a semi-gloss to a gloss sheen to them. Even the dashboards. So instead of going this route again, I've rounded up about every shade of gray that I have laying around here, and I've been doing some testing, and I think I found a pretty good match. Duplicolor bumper coating. And this is the charcoal flavor. This is a lacquer rather than an enamel like some of these, so there's no recoat window and I could always add more coats if needed. The other nice thing about a lacquer is you can put a lacquer or an enamel on top of lacquer once it's dried. If you go the other way around and try and put lacquer on top of an enamel after it is dried, there's a chance it could lift or not lay down right or cause something else weird to happen. And if I look at this OEM dash, you can see this texture is more of a natural vinyl texture Whereas this looks just kind of like a lot like truck bed coating. So what my plan to do is here is to sand this down and knock down all these high points so that I'll have these flat areas and then the recessed areas below. Now I'm not sure how well this paint is going to sand, so I'll play it safe and start off with some 400 grit. Now just like when wet sanding any kind of bodywork, there's a chance I'll sand through this on the raised edges just from the pressure of my fingers. So I have two blocks here. I have a more rigid block that I'll use for the flat areas and a slightly more flexible block that I can use for these curved areas. And we'll start with the rigid block on this recessed area. Okay, it's knocking it down a little bit. That feels better actually. And you can't really tell at all, but it is sort of knocking down these high points. You can hear my fingernails hitting all those sharp tips. And here it's a little bit more of a smooth surface. Okay, I've given this plenty of time to dry. I used the uh, soy base wax and grease remover. So I wanna make sure that because this was a water-based paint, I gave it plenty of time for that to absorb because I'm sure it might have soaked some of that into the surface. And now it's time for the bumper coating. Now, whenever I'm combining different types of paints that were never meant to be used together, I always do it in a hidden inconspicuous area. So if this does lift or peel or whatever, or melt off, uh, it's gonna be hidden on the bottom and it'll be easy for me to reapply that texture and start over. I don't want this to happen on the top recessed area where I've spent so much time. Let's give that a minute. And there's no lifting of any sort happening there, so I'd say we're good to paint the whole thing. I always get the hard to reach areas first. All right, the first coat has dried and look at that texture. I'm liking the sheen. I'm gonna do some more coats. All right, that two coats was plenty. This thing looks great now. And look at the sheen on my dash that I restored compared to the original dash. You can see it's about the same. A Little more texture on this one. I could have seen this down a little bit more, I think. And here's the dash I restored using the vinyl and then the Duplicolor Vinyl and Fabric Paint. You can see it has a very matte finish. So I'm really happy with the way this turned out. I want your honest opinion here. Do you think it looks good? I will say it was a lot easier and faster to spray on the texture than to wrap it with the vinyl and mess around with the contact cement. But I'll put a link for the how-to video of the vinyl wrapped dash in the description and let you all decide which method to try on your cracked dash. The next step for this dash is the extreme cold and heat test, where it sits in my uninsulated garage through an Ohio winter, and then 
sits out in a hot car all summer. And I'll let you know how it holds up. Thanks for watching.